Hey guys, so this is going to be take two of the FortiSwitch 448D high level overview. Um, I got the video uploaded and for some reason the audio just looked like complete trash. So um, I'm going to redo it, right? Because it was bugging me. Anyways, um, this is going to be a very high level review of the Switch and some of its features. We will have significantly more in-depth videos. There's going to be a whole series about the Forta Switch actually. Um, everything from managing it with a Forta gate to using it in standalone, the various things you can do with it, etc. So this is going to be the 10,000 foot view. Should take about 10 minutes or so, maybe longer if I get long-winded. You never know. That's kind of how I go though. So we'll get started. This is the management page login. We're using the default pa username of admin, password of nothing. So I just kick this switch on. You can actually see the box behind me where I just pulled it out. Uh, the dashboard gives you a very high level view of everything. Host name, serial number, BIOS version, firmware version, etc. As you can see, this Ford, uh, this Ford switch is using firmware 601. Uh, most of the switches that I have out in production are actually running 621 now. Uh, it just works better on the switches. This particular one is operating in local management mode, which means it's not managed by FortiGate or anything like that. It's just a local switch where you configure all your stuff on it as is. On the left, you have your actual your uh, icon list, and we're just going to run through this really quick. Interfaces, this is where you can see your physical interfaces for the system, as well as VLANs and loopbacks. As you guys know, loopback addresses are actually uh, logical interfaces that are always up. That way you can hit them regardless of the uh, various interfaces that are up or down that might be dependent on it. Uh, you can configure your VLANs just like you would on a FortiGate. You click Add VLAN, you, you define the VLAN name, the VLAN ID, uh, administrative access if any, etc. And assign an IP address to it. These switches are able to actually go out to the internet and check for DNS. So you can actually set you know primary and secondary servers as well as your FQDN. So if you use uh, domains and anything like that, you're good there. Uh, settings, IP conflict detection, which is on by default. If you click under um, your config section, this is where you're able to actually set your SNMP traps. And we'll do a, a, a deep dive on this, but basically the Forda switch is able to do versions 1, uh, 2, 3, etc. So uh, you have some options there. And then as far as the actual traps that it's able to do or the events that it's able to monitor, you have uh, you know, you, CPU utilization, uh, whether or not the config was changed, interface IP being uh, altered, as well as you know, log disk being low and memory being low. So uh, just like you can on the FortiGate. You have your actual firmware section where you're able to you know, choose your firmware and update it, etc. We'll have a video that walks through the process of updating a FortiSwitch's firmware. Um, you're able to actually back up the config. Just like a FortiGate, you want to keep backups of your configuration. It's going to save you. Uh, out of the box on 6.0 and newer, it does revisions on logout and upgrade, which means it's going to keep a local copy on disk. So if you forget to back it up, at least you'll have that um, saved. And again, this is where the revisions actually live. And as you can see here, it's got a revision from where I set the IP on it to the 10.100.100.195. So that's neat. You look at your revisions and see, you know, actually what's configured, etc. But please, please, please make it a habit to back up your stuff before you do anything. Licensing, you're able to actually apply licenses to the device. Uh, change mode, this is where you change it from standalone mode or local manage mode to actual FortiLink management so your FortiGate or whatever can can manage it. Um, I will say that if you have it hooked up to a FortiGate via a FortiLink port on the FortiGate, whenever the FortiGate detects that there's a Forti switch down there, it'll actually change the mode for you most of the time. So this particular page isn't of much use unless for some reason it just doesn't do it. Uh, time, you're able to set NTP, as you can see, it thinks it's 1970, baby, which means it's about 16 years before I was born. Interesting stuff. Uh, you can set it to an NTP server, whether that be your local AD server, etc., or you can set manual time. 
SSL, you can actually present certain SSL certificates for the administration page, just like you would on a FortiGate, so you wouldn't get this ugly, not secure page. Um, as well as you can actually use 8021X for your uh, public key, so you can actually do the higher quality um, authentication using radius and things like that. Administratively, you're able to set everything on it just like you would afford to get your administrator, the profile that they're able to use, see, do, etc., and the settings that they can do. You can define users and groups as well. Authentication, you're able to actually configure LDAP, Radius, and TACAX. So what you're looking at here is if you want to configure ports to use 802.1x authentication, you're able to use LDAP servers, etc. for the actual authentication process. Uh, super critical in enterprise environments because you're almost always going to have AD or LDAP or something of that nature that you're going to rely on to be able to do your authentication because you certainly don't want to push accounts to each local device, right? So, and then obviously these are the three different ways that you could actually do said authentication. Uh, most environments tend to use the LDAP or, or RADIUS in my experience. And then of course you can actually install the certificates locally on the box. This is your certificate management page. The actual switch itself, you're able to look at the physical port, which is cool, right? So you can tell the link speed, whether or not it's up or down description. You can actually run cable diagnostics to see if you have a layer one issue. Always start at layer one. And then of course you can look at your trunk ports as well. When you click interface, this is going to be more of the logical interface configuration. This is where you're able to see the ports, the VLANs that are tagged for them, etc. As well as whether or not it's an edge port, whether or not it has a uh, spinning tree enabled, etc. So, some pretty good high level information here. Sorry I'm losing my voice a little bit. Same thing on the trunk port side, you can see what uh, VLANs are allowed, etc. Um, we'll go into some details as to why you would probably not allow a VLAN to traverse past a certain trunk port, etc. Port security, you're able to configure port security on the interface so that, you know, if a user from accounting logs in, they get the accounting VLAN, etc. And that's going to tie back to the LDAP authentication or radius or whatever you're using. Uh, spanning tree to help prevent network loops and set things like that. You're able to configure the settings as far as timers, as well as you can actually configure instances and how they're going to behave on various VLANs and interfaces, which is pretty cool. Uh, flap guard interface flapping sucks. Flap guard gives you the ability to monitor and keep up with the duration as well as the flap rate. LLDP link layer. Uh, Discovery Protocol. This is where you're able to actually configure a profile that the switch will use for LLDP, where it's going to talk back and forth and go, hey, what kind of device are you? Oh, you're a phone. Let me put you in the voice VLAN by default so you can just keep on keeping on. You can also set priority and things like that via this profile. Uh, by default, there's two. There's a default profile as well as the default auto ISL. This basically means that any interface that has this ISL one configured, if they're two FortiNet net devices or Forti switches or Forti gates, whatever, Forti gate to Forti switch, Forti switch to Forti switch, etc., it'll automatically form an inter switch link between the two, which is nifty. Um, and then this is your global LLDP settings. Uh, S flow, you can configure an S flow collector here. Uh, most environments to do this are using something like StealthWatch, etc., to actually monitor S flow, which will give you a pretty good description of, or a pretty good detail on what's going on. Port mirroring, any data that's touching port one, for instance, you can mirror to port two so that you can put a live tap on it without having to interrupt the stream. Beautiful technology, extremely powerful for whenever you're troubleshooting. Definitely recommended. Uh, VLAN, this is where you actually configure your, your VLANs and the various things that are accessible on it, etc. Virtual wires, just like on a FortiGate, you're able to pair two ports together and make it a virtual wire. Uh, very good for kind of man in the middling things, etc.
Storm Control. Storm Control gives you the ability to restrict traffic for uh, broadcast, multicast, and unicast. And basically what that does is if you have a large network that's a flat subnet, and there's a lot of broadcast traffic, or maybe there's a lot of multicast traffic just trying to go all over the place, you can enable this and actually tell it to drop or rate limit depending on what you uh, prefer the various types of traffic that tend to cause issues. So we'll go into bigger detail on that. Uh, MAC entries, you can actually assign MAC entries to various interfaces and VLANs, etc. Uh, QoS, there's a lot that goes into QoS. We're going to have our own standalone section on that, but basically uh, prioritization, like if you assign voice traffic to get a DSCP of 46, it's a higher priority, it's going to try to get preference over everything else to try to help those uh, technologies that are dependent on either bandwidth latency or you know things like that to get a little preference on it. And then of course your monitoring tab which is where you could monitor your forwarding table, your actual port stats like you know traffic flow, things of that nature. Um, very good from a high level point so you can tell which ports are sending the most traffic etc. And as you can see it's mostly internal because I'm just hitting it via management. You're able to look at your spanning tree instances from here. So it tells you how everything's set up there. Your modules, your SFP modules. Uh, the cool thing about FortiSwitch is, is that every switch that has SFP modules, you're basically getting extra ports. For instance, the, f the 8 port, the world's most horrible FortiSwitch, right? It has 10 ports, even though it is sold as an 8 port switch, because ports 1 through 8 are standard Ethernet RJ45, and then you have the two. SFP modules where you can add more Ethernet or fiber connectivity, etc. You can look at your actual LLDP configuration monitor so you can see what devices are coming back as what. And then, of course, your loop guard, your flap guard, etc., so you can see if your network has a loop in it, if a certain interface is flapped X number of times, or if you run into situations where maybe it's, it's flapping all the time. A lot of very good visibility on the device. You're able to set static routes on these things. When they're in standalone mode, they do routing. When they're in fortaling mode, the FortiGate will do the routing. But the relatively intelligent switches. And then, of course, you have uh, your actual interface configurations from like uh, you know access, IP, etc., and then the routes and things of that nature that are tied to them. Uh, you can do link probes to see if an interface is up or down, etc. Kind of like a health check monitor. And of course, you can monitor your route table just like you would any other device or a FortiGate. And then you have your logs. Uh, I recommend sending these to a Forti Analyzer or Splunk or an Elk Stack configuration or something like that. But you know, whatever you need. Um, <coughs> And then your log configuration of what you actually find to be useful, as well as if you wanted to configure syslog to go to Splunk, for instance, you can configure the level of information that you wish to see. So, as you can see, FortiSwitch is behind the curve on a lot of things um, when compared to like Aruba or Cisco switches, or even AdTrans switches, but they do have a very wide range of feature set that is very useful in most enterprises, and if you're a Fortinet shop, just the fact that you can manage this thing from a FortiGate anyways, helps you at least keep your security fabric, you know, fleshed out, and that single pane of glass, which I hate that term by the way, but it's true, it's a single pane of glass, from a management and security perspective. It lets you dive in and see everything from that one that one device. So very powerful device. You can manage it from your FortiGate. You can do management via the FortiGate over layer three, which is cool as well. Uh, we will have videos that cover all of that. But that is a high level, that's your ten thousand foot view. That's everything a standard switch does normally. It misses out on some of the cooler stuff that we'll go into detail later. But as you can see, it's got a pretty strong feature set. It's even got the, the damn CLI GUI widget that I didn't show you. So 
but uh, stay tuned for more videos. We're going to have step by step for each individual section. Uh, that way we can kind of deep dive into what is what and why is it important. Um, so you can really, you guys are really going to learn a lot about Florida switches if you've never touched one. So stay tuned and uh, if you have any questions specific to it that you would like me to dive into, please comment below because I would love to um, make the videos that are of higher interest first with regards to the Florida switch before I just start going this is how you manage one via FortiGate. This is how you configure a VLAN. This is how you update firmware. If you guys want to dive in and do 8021X authentication first, we'll hit that one first. So uh, thank you guys. Let me know if you need anything. Hit the comments below with recommendations or questions so that we can make videos specific to what you need. And I'll catch you next time.